Welcome back everybody. And in today's video, we are gonna move on to our next topic here, which is a super important one. We've been building up to it for a while now, and it's this, this concept of NP completeness. So here's the definitions of hard, being NP hard and being NP complete. So NP hard means that it's at least as hard as every NP problem. And then NP complete is the intersection of NP hardness and NP. So NP hard is like as hard or harder than every NP problem. And NP complete means that it's at least as hard as every NP problem and it itself is an NP problem. So this is the formal, this is why I'm saying that means like the hardest or most difficult NP problem. That's what a problem would be to be NP complete. And it shouldn't be clear that any NP complete problem even exists. Uh, it's not obvious that we can use some NP problem to solve every other NP problem. But that's what we're gonna see. Um, and as you can guess, it, it does exist. And in fact, the number of the problems we've looked at already are NP complete, as it turns out. So just to give you a picture of this, where we're at, we can think of this as um, kind of concentric circles or a scale. So I wanna think of this as a scale from, at the bottom of the scale is like easy problems and at the um, top of the scale is like impossible. And you know, hardness is somewhere along this scale. And remember hardness means what's the best possible algorithm to solve that problem. So down at the easiness end of the spectrum is the class P. So P is somewhere down here. There's all the problems inside there that are like um, sorting and max, you know, finding the largest thing in the list or addition, um, etc. Multiplication, all those things are doable in polynomial time. Okay, then what have we talked about beyond P? Well, there's a class called RP and that definitely contains every problem that's in P but also might contain a little bit more. So there are some problems that we know how to solve in random polynomial time that we don't know how to solve in polynomial time. So that's maybe like another class above. Certainly every problem that I can solve in polynomial time, I could also solve if I have randomness, but maybe a little bit more. That's not as important as the next class up that we've talked about. And there's, there's more classes in between here that we haven't talked about, but NP, is kind of the next class up. So that at the bottom of NP is the P problem. So remember, we determined that every problem that can be solved in polynomial time can also be checked trivially by just, you can check the answer by just computing it again. Um, but maybe NP contains some things that aren't in P. So like what's up here in the group that's outside of um, P and RP but is inside NP would be things like vertex cover and ham cycle and factorization, factoring large numbers, um, hitting set. So a lot of those problems that we've talked about recently are in this category. And then we are also thinking about kind of the other extreme. If we think about NP hard, what does that mean? Is NP hard is kind of the more expensive NP problems and then everything above that. So NP hard is up here in orange. Um, so at the very top of this, and we'll talk about this in a second, is you should remember this from your theory class. The most impossible problem that, we've, that you've probably heard of is something that's called the uh, halting problem. So determining, writing a program to determine whether another computer program will ever finish um, processing some input. So that's like at the realm of impossible. What you saw in your previous class is that if we had any program to solve the halting problem, it would create this paradox that if the program exists, then it doesn't exist. And um, so therefore it doesn't exist. And, and so that's like all the way at the top of this NP hardness, but there's a lot of other things that are in here. Like for example, determining whether two context-free grammars are the same is up here. That's not known to be a member of NP. 
And so what we're talking about with NP completeness is the things that are right in this intersection, right up here. So the things that are a member of NP and their NP hard. And so like vertex cycle and ham cycle are up here, vertex cover and ham cycle. Uh, it turns out integer factorization is probably not in this group of NP complete problems. Um, and I can't tell you why that is yet, but that's a little teaser of something that we'll be able to say. Okay, so let's now get into this. Um, our first MP hard proof is just gonna prove that the halting problem, which we said is all the way at the top of this hierarchy with like undecidable problems, that that's NP hard. So what do we have to prove here? The, again, the point of this is not really to say anything about the, the halting problem. Of course, we know the halting problem is hard. It's more to give us an idea of the structure of an NP hard proof. So to prove this, we have to start with any NP problem, because that's what it means for something to be NP hard, is that it can solve any NP problem. So I'll say, let A be any NP problem. And what do we know about something just from the fact that it's an NP problem? Well, we really don't know anything about it except that it has short certificates and fast verifiers. Um, so it has a fast verifier algorithm, uh, let's call it V. Okay, and that takes like an input as well as a certificate. And now, how can I answer the halting problem, uh, sorry, how can I answer A? Um, so I'll say, let I be an input to problem A, and we wanna know whether A of I is true or false. Well, um, I can say, I can write a program. So here's my program for every possible certificate C. What am I gonna do is try to run the verification on that input and C. So if the verification of that input with C equals yes, then I return yes, and that's it. Now notice that I could go potentially through an infinite um, possible number of certificates, but even if there's only a finite number of certificates, I can say else um, infinite loop. And now I've just designed a program that will halt and return yes if this uh, if A should return true. So if there is some certificate, then it'll return yes and halt. Otherwise, if there is no certificate for this input, that means that the answer is no, then it'll loop forever. So this either halts and works and returns yes, or it just goes into an infinite loop. And then I finally return the halting problem on my program. So remember, the halting problem takes in any program and tells you whether it will eventually stop or not. And so that's what I'm doing here. Um, what we're saying is we make a program that will halt only if the real answer is yes. And so this shows us that if I could somehow answer the halting problem, then I could also answer any NP problem. Um, because I just, supposedly if you can solve the halting problem, then you can look at any program and tell whether or not it's going to eventually finish. And that tells us whether or not a certificate exists for A. So it's a little bit of a, of a mind, uh, mind exercise, but this is a proof that the halting problem could be used to solve any NP problem. So we could imagine like this could be the um, Hamiltonian path problem. The input is a graph. The certificate would be a path in that graph, but we don't know what that certificate is. You just write a program that would try every possible um, circuit to see if that's a valid um, Hamiltonian path. And if one of them would eventually return yes, then that program halts, otherwise the program runs forever. And that's exactly what the halting problem can answer. Okay, so that's placed the halting problem as NP hard, but as we said, that's not that interesting because the halting problem is also undecidable. What we're really interested in is I guess another way of looking at this is you could say NP complete problems are the hardest NP problems. They're also the easiest NP hard problems. They're right at that intersection. And here's two of them that will turn out to be uh, NP complete. Today we're gonna focus on circuit sat. So that's this first one and, and these problems are both related. So the sat here stands for satisfiability. 
Um, so circuit sat says the input is any Boolean circuit that has and or not gates with a bunch of inputs and one output. And the question is, can you um, set the inputs to make the output be true? OK, so the input size could just be like big O of n, where n is the number of gates. And we just have to specify what are the gates, like what is the type of each gate, and then how are they wired together. And the three sat problem, which we'll talk about probably next time, is about Boolean formulas, um, which is related to circuits, but uh, that's what it'll be the next thing that we, that we see. And so to remember what is going on with these circuits, I'm going to bring you back a trip down memory lane with um, circuit first. So this is probably something that you use in your computer architecture class. Here we have a Boolean circuit with a bunch of gates that I made. There's a light at the end of it that I'll turn on if this is true. And what we want to ask is, is there a way to set these input bits, these input switches, to some values so that the light bulb turns on? That's what the circuit pro sat problem is asking. So the circuit sat problem would essentially describe this circuit, describe this picture, and then you have to say yes or no based on whether there is some way to set these input bits to turn the light on. And this one setting turns out to be the only one from the way that I designed this circuit that makes the light turn on. So in this case, circuit sat would be true. The certificate of it would be that this setting of the bits, like 1001. OK, so this problem is uh, seems to be an NP problem. Um, we can quickly check the answer if it's true. But if it's not true, it's like you have to try every possibility. So that's the circuit sat problem. Let me go back to my other window. And um, the cool thing about this is this is what's going to allow us to talk about any NP problem and connecting this to say, how could this be used to solve anything else? Because remember, what do we have to do for this NP hard proof? We have to start with any NP problem. So it's it could be A, this problem A could be vertex cover, could be Hamiltonian cycle, could be factorization, could be literally anything. Any, well, not literally anything, literally any NP problem. And we just have to use the fact that it has a verification algorithm to somehow say we can solve it. And so the fact that our computers are made out of circuits is why circuit set is a good candidate to try to prove that it's NP hard. And so now we have to think a little bit back to computer architecture. How does, um, how does your computer work is that you have a state which is like memory. So you know RAM and um, registers, et cetera. Uh, and what the, your, the way that your program really looks like is that inside the combinational circuit is like adders and muxes and stuff. And it's really like. Cir circling back on itself. So when you run your processor, your your CPU is constantly cycling the clock, taking the current state, which is like a current state of your registers and RAM and addresses. Then based on what those things are, it runs it through all of the adders and muxes and stuff that's in your CPU and then updates that. And when the clock cycles, it's going to update that state and get the next one, the next one, the next one. So that's how an actual CPU works. And I'll just remind you as well that we built something like a CPU in, um, in Circuitverse. So this is some kind of primitive CPU. And just remember that what's in all these elements is some um, ALUs and gates, basically gates and or gates, and then some components that have memory, like RAM and all these flip-flops. So you can imagine the whole state of this, the whole way that this works is you have a bunch of like gates, a combinational part, then a whole bunch of flip-flops and memory things that are just getting updated every time through the clock. And so that's all we're saying. This circuit is really big. If you were to write out the whole circuit for your CPU, it'd be huge, but it's constant. So this is actually, even though it's huge, it might have in your real CPU, it might have uh, many millions of gates, but uh, that's a constant. That's big O of one, because um, it's not changing based on the size of the input. The point is that your CPU can solve any size problem. You don't have to get a bigger CPU to solve a larger problem. You just have to wait longer. And so that's why uh, we can say that this is like a constant size. And what we want to prove is this lemma down here that any decision problem 
that has a polynomial time algorithm can be simulated by a polynomial size circuit. So a single circuit can simulate any decision problem. So remember the real way that the, our CPU works is I have some state like memory and flip-flops and stuff that feeds in with many wires into the gates, the combinational circuit, and then the output of those feed back into the flip-flops. And this is how uh, the real computer works. Uh, you have a clock that's like this thing and that feeds into the memory in order to update it every time it goes. But we can now think about if I know that my program only takes a polynomial number of steps, I can just imagine making that many copies of all the gates. So I'm get, I can take these gates and I will copy them and then paste and paste and paste and paste and paste. Right, so what, what I'm gonna do is instead of having memory, I'm just gonna directly wire the outputs from one set of gates into like the next copy of my CPU. Then the next copy will go onto here and the next copy will go onto here. And I only have to do that a polynomial of N um, number of times. And so what I do by doing that is I take my inputs, which is like the original settings, the original um, inputs to whatever my problem are. And now I'm saying that I have some massive big circuit that only has gates, no memory elements. And at the end of it is, this is my attempt at drawing a light bulb. Um, I don't know how to draw a light bulb, but anyway, something like that. Uh, the light bulb turns on or off depending on whether the answer is true or false. So we can take any real computer that has memory elements like flip-flops and gates, and we can simulate that with a whole bunch of copies of the gates, of the adders and muxes part of that CPU to make a massively, massively, you know, now if we're thinking about a program that write, might run for a million steps on your real CPU, then you would have to like have a million copies of all the combinational elements of your CPU all wired together. But if you did that, and if you could build that thing, then um, we would be able to instantly turn it on. And as long as it takes for the um, logic to the electricity to run through those million CPUs and however many power plants you would have to have to power them all, at the end, we would see the answer to your problem without having to actually use a clock. So what we're really doing here is we're making it a pure circuit um, to remove the memory. So we replace the memory with um, copies of all the gates. And again, the reason that it works is really because we're talking about polynomial time. So if we had an algorithm that would run longer, we would need more gates here and it would no longer be polynomial size. Um, but because we're talking about polynomial time algorithms, then we can always model it as one gigantic, unrealistically large circuit um, that the light bulb turns on or off depending on whether the answer is true or false. And so now we're ready to say why circuit set is NP hard. The proof is gonna look really similar to the proof of why the halting problem is NP hard, but we're gonna to have to use this idea of making the super circuit um, to count for that problem. So let, let's just recall, how do we start out? We say let A be any NP problem. We want to solve this with circuit set. Uh, and I is an input for A. right? So we want to answer the question of what should the answer to A be on input I? Well, because it's NP, because A is in NP, there exists polytime um, verifier, verifier of an input and a certificate um, that returns yes for some certificate C if um, A of I is true. Right, so that's how the verifier algorithms works. When we've been proving NP, what we've been saying is that there's a fast verifier algorithm that if the real answer is yes, then there's some certificate that proves that it's yes. Okay, so now what do I have to do? 
is I think about this verifier program. So now I turn that verifier program, turn the verifier program into a giant circuit where uh, all these things are inputs, but where the inputs for I, like the actual input to the original problem, like in the case A is the Hamiltonian cycle, this, this I would be like the graph, are um, hardwired. So what I mean by that is that our giant circuit that we make, so this, we have a giant circuit. So we have a circuit, I don't know, I guess I can't call it C, so I'll call it um, T of C that takes in just a certificate takes a certificate and returns yes if that's a certificate for i on this algorithm. OK, so after all this, what we can do is we're just saying we take the verifier algorithm for a, turn that into a giant circuit that's able to try every possible certificate. And now the circuit sat problem is able to do that for us. So we just return circuit sat of t. So this tells us whether there exists a certificate that would verify that input. If, if there is any certificate, that means any way of flipping those bits that verifies the, the original input, then the answer is yes. If the circuit is not satisfiable, that means that there's no way of setting those bits that'll make the verifier return true. That means that there's no certificate that proves that the answer is yes. That means that the answer is no. So circuit set, this problem that's just checking whether a circuit is possible to turn on the light bulb, is able to tell us whether there exists any certificate for this verifier. And that's, that's a proof that circuit set is NP hard. So if I have any NP problem, all I know about the problem is that it has a fast verifier. I can turn that into an input for circuit set that's able to answer the original question. And now all that's left to show is that circuit set is also a member of NP. So remember, for something to be NP complete, it has to be NP hard. That's what we just proved with this very sophisticated, cool argument on the last slide with our giant CPU simulation thing here. Um, so that combined with the fact that circuit set is in NP is going to be the, mean that it's NP complete. And so what do we have to say that it's a member of NP? Well, we have to say that there's a fast certificate and a um, fast small certificate and a fast verifier. So the certificate is the setting of input bits to make uh, the output come out true. And the verifier is just run the circuit on those bit values. Right, so just again, going back to circuit verse, the proof that this circuit is satisfiable is just the setting of these bits 1001. And to check it, I just plug in those bit values and I could compute the, what all of the gates are and eventually get the output. And indeed, this verifies that it's circuit satisfiable. Okay, so now we have circuit set is not only NP hard, but it's NP complete. So it's a member of NP, but it's also at least as hard as everything in NP. So it's kind of like the ultimate NP problem. And this is really, really cool because it allows us that if P is not equal to NP, it's connected to whether circuit set is in P or not. So if, um, so now we have kind of like an if and only if relationship that if circuit sat is not um, in P, then P is not equal to NP. That would be the chain for any NP problem. But it's also true the other way around, that if circuit sat is in P, if you can come up with a polynomial time algorithm for circuit sat, then P is equal to NP. Because circuit sat is the hardest problem in NP. So what this means is that this question of P versus NP before, until we had NP completeness, there's always a risk that you might find, like maybe you're super brilliant and you come up with a polynomial time algorithm for some NP problem. And you're like, yes, I get a million dollars. But they say, no, you don't, because maybe just that problem was easy, but all, a bunch of other NP problems are hard. And so you were stuck with like, in order to prove that P is not equal to NP, you have to prove something about every NP problem. 
Well, not anymore, because we've proved that circuit set is the ultimate, is the hardest NP problem. And so in order to prove something about P versus NP, I just have to prove something about circuit set. If we can just understand whether circuit set has a polynomial time algorithm or not, or prove that it doesn't have any polynomial time algorithm, that's enough to prove whether P is equal to NP. And uh, so I think that that's where we're gonna leave you today. And the teaser that I'll give you is that it's not the only one.